My name is Laurie Harris. I'm Assistant Professor of Religious Studies uh, here at Michigan State University. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to uh, this event um, put on by the Michael Lane and Elaine Serling Institute for Jewish Studies and Modern Israel. Um, there's lots of literature about our program um, outside of the auditorium if you're interested in receiving our uh, newsletter um, and be on our email list. Uh, I invite you to, to check in there. Um, but this evening, I'm really delighted to welcome um, Sarah Hurwitz, um, fresh off the plane from Washington, uh, D.C. today. Yes. Um, Sarah um, uh, was a um, uh, speechwriter for Hillary Clinton, for candidate Hillary Clinton, for president, candidate and president Barack Obama, um, and most um, uh, recently, um, First Lady Michelle Obama. Um, before um, taking um, the past uh, two years in her post-White House career um, to write a book about Judaism. Um, and this book is available uh, after the talk for anybody who is interested. There are free copies to take away. It's called Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life in Judaism after finally choosing to look there. Which I think it's the award for the longest book title. It's very long. long. Yes, yeah. it takes a while to say. <laughs> um, it takes up the whole cover. <laughs> um, um, and uh, Sarah asked to do this talk as a Q&A today because um, as those of you who have had the chance to look at the book already will see, um, she has a very kind of conversational style of writing about her experiences uh, doing uh, Jewish learning um, as, uh, as an adult. Um, so please join me in welcoming Sarah. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. This is a beautiful, beautiful campus. It's a very nice break from Washington, D.C., so thank you for having me. We have a lot more trees. You do. Oh, they're gorgeous. We do trees very well here. In this beautiful. <laughs> um, so, Sarah, you, you are not the scion of a political family. You <laughs> the are, is, no, not so much. <laughs> you are not like a fifth generation D.C. girl. Um, so I can't help but begin by asking, how does a girl from suburban Boston end up working in the White House? Well, that's a long story, but I'll tell it quickly. Um, I got my first job or internship in politics. I interned in Vice President Al Gore's speech writing office in 1998, which will date me a little bit. And the writers I worked for helped me get my first job out of college, which was to be the assistant for the speech writer for the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland which was roughly as glamorous as it sounded. I commuted three hours a day round trip. I sat in a windowless cubicle next to the bathroom, and I quit after nine months. I then got a job as a speechwriter for Senator Tom Harkin for Iowa, wonderful Democratic senator. Um, I didn't really know how to write speeches. I knew how to write, but not speeches. And after nine months, his chief of staff sat me down and said, you should really go to law school. That would be a better fit for you. So I took the hint, went to law school, and my third week of class, I met a guy named Josh Gottheimer, who used to be, a, he previously been a speechwriter for President Clinton. He was now in law school with me. And we just started freelance speech writing together. And he really taught me how to write to be heard rather than read, which are two different skills. And he taught me how to structure a speech. And so he and I, we got jobs together on Wes Clark's primary campaign in 03, Clark lost. We got jobs on Senator John Kerry's general campaign for president in 04, and then Harry lost. <laughs> and then Josh helped me get a, and then I was a lawyer for two years, which was sufficient. And then Josh helped me get a job on Hillary Clinton's campaign in 08, and you'll see the pattern, she lost. Um, but I got very lucky because my friend John Favreau, who I worked with on the Kerry campaign in 04 as a speechwriter, happened to be in 08 Barack Obama's chief speechwriter. And he is now, the head of Pod Save America, that whole empire, but back then he was Obama's chief speechwriter, and he called me after Hillary conceded, and he said, I'm really sorry, but would you come work for me now? I said yes. Got myself to Chicago. Uh, third day I was there, some John came to me and said, you are, we need you to write Michelle Obama's convention speech. And I actually said, like, I, I got kind of offended. I was like, well, oh, I'm the girl, so I'm gonna write for the girl, and no, I'm here to write for him, which is really obnoxious at the time. Um, but he said, yes, that's what's happening. You do need to write the speech. And so glad he did, because that's where I met Michelle Obama. We really hit it off. Loved working with her. She wrote that speech with her. And then, you know, but mainly I was writing for him. He won. No experience for me. And then we went to the White House, where I wrote for him for about two years. And then I decided that I missed writing for her, so I switched over to being her head speech writer. So that is how I got to the White House. Quite a, quite a lot of failure, very zigzag, not, didn't look, look 
a little room, looked a little dicey there at a certain point, but you know, finally managed to be on a winning campaign. And for all of the college students in the room today, just notice that it started with a summer internship. Yes. <laughs> um, so what was your day-to-day -day life like working in, in the White House? Uh, a, when you were working, uh, writing for President Obama, and then afterwards writing for the First Lady? Yeah, you know, you spend a lot of time as a speechwriter alone in front of a screen, right? It is not how it looks on the West Wing. It's not like, you know, it's, it's not quite as glamorous as it looks a lot of the time. But, you know, when you're writing for someone like Michelle Obama or, or President Obama, these are people who know who they are, they know what they want to say, they're very, very smart and quite directed in their thinking. And so you sit down with them and they say, okay, here's what I want to say. And they dictate the themes of the speech, the points of the speech, they dictate a lot of the language of the speech. And your job is to type as fast as humanly possible <laughs> because they are brilliant, right? And I, there were so many times I would just be sitting there typing, thinking, this is so good. <laughs> like, I've got to get this down. I need to, because, you know, I worked mainly for Mrs. Obama as well, speak to her, you know, she's a natural, right? She speaks in this beautiful, vivid, brilliant language. She, she speaks in paragraphs, kind of naturally, which is just kind of maddening, right? It's like, who can do this? But I, she was so talented in that way, and I learned so much from her. Um, so then I would work that into a draft, send it around to my colleagues, get edits from them, and then, you know, I would get a lot of fact checking, but we were very careful. Every line of every speech I ever wrote was really carefully fact checked by a team of fact checkers. I know it seems adorable and quaint now, but that is what we did back then. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I would send it to her, and then we would go back and forth. She would edit. I would offer edits on her edits. She would edit my edits. I mean, it was, she was very particular about every word. She had extraordinarily high technical standards. Uh, which was great, right? And she made me a much better writer. Like every transition had to be seamless. Every, the flow, she says such, she's such a logical lawyer's mind that she would immediately sense when something was out of order, right? She's like, no, Sarah, this point does not lead to this point. And you know, she really had a sense. And she was always kind and productive, right? It was never like, I don't like this, I don't know why. It was just like, okay, this is a good start. Here's what I think we need to do. Just really directed and lovely. And it was an utter joy to work for her. Just an utter joy. And to travel with her, I think, was just such a highlight of my time in the White House because, you know, back then when the President and First Lady of the United States, the Obamas, when you would travel the world with them, like, you would get into the motorcade and there would be people lining the streets, like eight people deep, waving American flags. It's like, you know, if the First Lady of fill in the country, Japan, Ghana, Argentina, China, whoever, if one of those First Ladies came to visit the US, like, would you know who that person is? Would school children be excited? No, I don't know who those people are. But no matter where we went in the world, people were so excited to see them. I think they represented something really special, and young people especially. Children would just be, you know, like 10 year old, five year old kids were so excited to see Michelle Obama. And it was really, it felt like just being part of a quite hopeful and kind of magical time in our history. It was a, a wonderful experience. I remember that the Washington Post ran a profile on you a couple of years ago, and the, the picture that they used was a picture of you sitting on, was it Air Force One? Yeah, it was actually, the First Lady has her, they have a plane for the First Lady, so it was not Air Force One. I, I did travel on that with the President, but it was with, I don't even know what we called it, Great Star, I had some name, but it was not Air Force One. <laughs> it was the two of you sort of sat side by side on a, um, a much more spacious airplane than I'm used to traveling on. It was nice, deep, not gonna lie. Deep in conversation over a, a speech that you had in your hands, so I sort of imagine that that's what your daily life looked like. <laughs> rarely, unfortunately, rarely. Although I will say, you know, you can get this sounds so snotty, but like, after traveling the way you travel in the White House, traveling commercial feels really annoying, right? Because like, in the White House, it's like you get in the motor, you get the White House, it whisks you to the Air Force Base, you step on the plane, it takes off. You know, the minute the first lady's on it, that door shuts and you take off. There's no security, there's no waiting. The flight attendants, they all know you. You've been traveling with them to eat for years. They're like, Sarah, here's your sparkling water that you like. And so and so, here's the popcorn that I know you like. It was very nice. Then your plane lands on tarmac, you get into the motorcade waiting there, and you get whisked to the event. And depending on the city, like, they might have stopped traffic for you. Right, and you have sirens, so you can, if there is traffic, you just cut right through it. It's, uh, it's you, this is why when you see on a campaign, you know, a president, or, you know, a presidential candidate or a president going to like four cities or four states in one day, and you say that it's not possible. Not possible commercial, very possible traveling, you know, presidential style uh, is really, it's quite something. 
I hate to break it to you, but your experience at BTW tomorrow is not going to be like It's not going to be the same right now. We once had a day where we went from D.C. to Nevada to Pennsylvania and back, and, and it wasn't even a long day, which is really quite, quite wild. It was great. It was great. Um, is there a particular speech that you, uh, that you wrote during your time in the White House that really kind of sticks in your memory that you're particularly proud of? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know... I think the 2016 convention speech, the when they go low, we go high, that was not my line, that was her line. She came up with it, I just typed it into the speech. But uh, I really, and I think that speech was a really special speech. Um, I also think, you know, in October of 2016, in the wake of the Access Hollywood tape that recorded Donald Trump bragging about the joys of sexually assaulting women, um, Mrs. Obama found that deeply troubling and, and was pretty determined to speak up about it. And she gave a very visceral, emotional speech about the cruelty of that kind of misogyny and that kind of violence and abuse. It was, it was personal and really passionate. And I just, you know, in the wake of that speech, we got so many emails and letters from people across the country. You know, women who said, I'm no longer going to be ashamed of what happened to me. Like, I, I'm not going to be ashamed. You made me feel like I can use my voice. We got a lot of letters and emails from men who said, thank you. You know, I, I don't talk like that. My brothers don't talk like that. My son, my father, we don't talk like that. That's not locker room talk. That's awful, right? Thank you for saying, you know, for making it clear how these men should talk. And I just, you know, it was such a, to impact people that way. And keep in mind, this was a good year before the Me Too movement kind of came out. If you actually go back and watch her speech, you'll be struck at how much of a precursor it was for that movement. Um, so that just was really, just to kind of make people who've been you know, who survived this kind of assault and abuse, make them feel seen and heard and regarded by their first lady. I think that was just a really very powerful experience. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, arguably, as a speechwriter, you were at the top of your career. You were writing at the White House, you were writing for the president, you were writing for the first lady. Um, now, in Washington, um, as we know well, there's this always kind of transition, right, after, after an election, after a change in the White House. Writing a book about Judaism isn't a typical next step, though. No, no it's not. It's really not. People were a little confused. Yes. So how, how is that different from some of the decisions made by your, your Yeah, I know. I mean, most of my colleagues just started their own speech writing companies, doing very well, no shortage of business. Um, yeah, actually, when I was thinking about writing this book, I sought out advice from people, and one of the people I spoke to, she said, oh, no, 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 no. Do not write that book. She, you, first, you write a book about politics. Or speech writing, or Michelle Obama, and then you can write that weird book that no one is going to buy. I'm like, okay. It, I will say she did have a point, right? Much easier to sell a political book than it is a book about Judaism. But um, you know, I I grew up like maybe some of you with the kind of you know two dull services a year, a boring sailor, a Hanukkah party, and Hebrew school that I hated, and that that was Judaism, right? So. I think I very logically at age 13, after my bat mitzvah, said, well, I'm done with this, which I still think was a good decision at the time. And then, you know, 25 years later, I broke up with a guy I was dating. I had a lot of time on my hands. I happened to hear about an intro to Judaism class at the local JCC, and I signed up just to fill time. It was like, okay, I should learn something about this tradition that I know nothing about. And I was blown away by what I found. You know, I... I I found this profound ethical wisdom. I found these, you know, I actually started to understand the very deep spiritual and moral and historical meanings behind our holidays. I actually saw the sophisticated theology that Judaism has. You know, I always thought that the Jewish God was an all-powerful man in the sky who rewards you if you're nice and punishes you if you're naughty and really loves your groveling prayers to him. It's like, well, I'm not an idiot. I don't believe that, so I must be an atheist. Seem clear. Um, it's actually not what Judaism says about God, right? A lot of very sophisticated theology, and I just thought, wow, we do a thoroughly good job of hiding this from Jews, <laughs> right? It's like we really we do a great job of just of hiding everything radical, wise, countercultural, brilliant, insightful, and just presenting people with the most boring, off-putting parts. And then we're so surprised when people walk away. It's like, well, how could they do that? Well, I, you know, basic communications mismatch here, but um. Yeah, so I started learning, I took a bunch more classes, I read hundreds of books on my own, I started attending Jewish meditation retreats, and, you know, I have to say, I think learning about Judaism was one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, you know, I, I, I have a law degree, I'm fairly bright, and I found it to be just excruciatingly difficult, right? Like, I think, you know, the options 
in terms of books seem to be these kind of intro nuts and bolts books, which are fine for helping you get the basics, or you can go study one tiny little area of Jewish law in some 500 page book written by a professor, which, no offense, but I'm not, I'm just not interested. And so I thought, like, why, why, why hasn't anyone written the book that covers the basics, but also unearths Judaism's deeper insights and done it in a way that's engaging and conversational and, and real and actually fun to read? And then I decided to write that book, and I discovered why no one has done this, because it is so incredibly hard. I mean, it made White House speech writing look like a joke, right? Like, I just could not get over how hard this is. Everything in Judaism is hyperlinked to everything else, right? But there's nowhere to start. I mean, it's like, well, okay, well, just like the phrase the rabbi said, well, you know, the rabbi said X. Okay, but who are the rabbis? Okay. In the year 70, when the Romans destroyed the temple, it's like, whoa, sorry, the temple. Okay, we used to sacrifice animals at a large, it's like, what are you talking about? Wait, there's just, what is the Torah? Like, really, what is it? I get it, thing on the scrolls, Hebrew, but what's this plot? What are its key animating ideas? Who wrote it? What year was it? What year was it compiled? What is, what is it made of? Wait, how many of us actually know the answers to this? Now let's get into the Talmud. How many of us know what that is, right? Um, guys, these are the key sacred texts of Judaism, and I'd say the vast majority of American Jews, no idea. I, I would also just put a finer point on it. Most Jews can probably tell you, like, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. You know, Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. But ask the average American Jew, what does Judaism say about what it means to be a good person? What does Judaism say about what happens after you die? And what does Judaism say about God? And I guarantee you, you're gonna get some really dumb answers. Like, to be a good person, to kun alum, social justice. Yeah, that's also Christianity. It's not that's just being a good person. Okay, after I die, there's no heaven? No, wait. There's no hell? Really? No, no. There's a whole afterlife situation in Judaism, but okay. You know, what does Judaism say about God? Loving, all-powerful, wait, Three most important questions people can ask about their lives, and we don't know answers. Okay, that, that, that's a problem. Right, and so I just, you know, I really feel a deep frustration with that because we have tremendous wisdom. I'm not gonna say we have answers because Judaism, there's never one simple, clear answer, right? There's a whole body of wisdom. There's a whole series of debates and you can actually learn so much and just get so much insight into how to be more deeply human, but none of us know it. And so I wrote a book, you know, it took me like 4,000 hours to begin to figure some of this stuff out and no one has that time. Right, that's crazy to say to people, well, just you know, spend a few thousand hours. Like, people maybe have a few hours every few months, right? Raising kids, working jobs, like people are stretched in. So I thought, okay, if I can just put this into a book that people can slowly read when they have a few minutes, maybe this could be helpful. So lots of people discover religion at points in their lives and become enamored with it, study their religious traditions of choice, um, adopt religious practices, become religious, seek to tell others about the religion and bring them into the fold. Is that, is, is that your story? Is that what you're trying to do in this book? Nope. <laughs> I am not, you know, I, people are very confused by me because it's like, oh, you're a Balchuba. You're, you're like one of those like people who got all orthodox and now you're gonna move to Israel and have 17 kids. I, I get it. It's like, no, no, I don't, I don't keep kosher. I don't observe the laws of Shabbat, right? So they say, oh, well, you're not more observant then. It's like, that's interesting, because last I checked, there were a lot of Jewish laws, 613 roughly, and like, a lot of them were ethical. So I think it's interesting that you're saying to me, well, you're not observant because you don't follow these ritual laws. No one has ever asked me, well, do you conduct your business affairs honestly? Are you careful with your speech? Do you visit the sick and those who are grieving? How much tzedakah, how much money do you give to those who are poor? It's funny that no one asked me about that, because the answer is that having studied the Jewish law around these topics, I'm so much more conscious of them, right? I'm much, I am more conscious of how I use my speech. I'm more conscious of how I treat people who are suffering. You know, I, I am, I just, I'm more aware. Am I anywhere near perfect? No, I screw these things up 15 times a day, but I used to screw them up 20 times a day. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm a little better now, right? And I, I, I think that's really important. So I just think, you know, I am more observant, and I, I wish people would maybe notice that, that Jewish observance actually, it involves more than just following rituals. So I don't, and, you know, I don't, I have no business prescribing any kind of practice to anyone. It is none of my business how people choose to be Judy, Jewish. What I do feel pretty strongly about is telling people to learn something. Just learn something. Just learn, learn something about Judaism and then decide what to do with it. Right? If 
if after learning, you know, a reasonable amount, you decide this is nonsense, I'm gonna go be a Buddhist, great. I, that's not my business, but don't reject it before you know anything. And I think that's what a lot of us, including me, by the way, have done, right? I was presented with a pretty unimpressive version of it, and I said, well, this is dumb, I'm out. I didn't know anything. So I think the thesis of my book, it's not do this or that, it's not my place, but it is learn deeply and then decide for yourself. What was what was it like to learn about Judaism as, as an adult um, versus as a, as a child? You know, in my research, I, I'm interested in education, educational settings, and how the Jewish educational landscape is changing in the 21st century. And it strikes me from um, a lot of things that you write in your book um, is that you couldn't have written this book even 50 years ago, that so many of the things that um, you took advantage of that were part of your adult Jewish educational journey um, were our sort of relatively recent additions to the Jewish educational landscape. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. Like, people often ask me, well, how do we fix Hebrew school? We gotta fix Hebrew school. It's like, Hebrew school isn't the problem. The problem is we don't know. The problem is we never grew up, right? We, we stopped learning at age 13, many of us. Some of you maybe didn't, that's great. Many of us stopped learning at age 13, grew up, had kids, were basically child Jews ourselves, and we say, uh-oh, someone's gotta teach this kid Judaism, I know. I'll dump it on the Hebrew school teacher and tell them, hey, I need you to teach my kid this 4,000-year-old tradition that involves language, cultures, rituals, life cycle ri rituals, holidays, Hebrew, and I need you to do it in three hours a week, but actually Noah has soccer two of those hours, so <laughs> it'll be one hour a week, thanks, and also they need to be ready for the requirements, right? Like, that's nuts, right? That the, the, the problem, I don't know what to do about Hebrew school, I'm not an expert, but I, I would suggest that we actually grow up first, and then I, I actually think you can teach your kids a lot and you maybe know some things, just, a, just an idea. Um, but you're right, you know, a lot of the opportunities that I've availed myself of didn't exist, you know, decades ago, right? I have studied at a yeshiva called Hadar, which is a totally egalitarian, you know, it is, it is totally friendly to LGBTQ people, it is totally friendly to women, right? This is an open and really rigorous place. A lot of people who study there are quite observant, but it, it's, it's really welcoming. You know, I've studied at a yeshiva in New York that was like a contemplative, meditative Jewish yeshiva, right? I've taken all these classes, I go on meditation retreats, you know, there are so many opportunities to learn now that certainly weren't available 50 years ago. And the truth is, you know, Judaism can be fun when you're a kid, right? It can be warm, it can create all sorts of really beautiful memories as a child, which I think are so important, you know, so that that fun, that sense of connection, and identity, and joy is so great. But like, you cannot learn anything meaningful and deep about Judaism until you're a teenager, I think, which is just when we stop learning. And uh, that's a real problem. Can you give some examples of that? Yeah, so, you know, you look, you can tell a kid, like, be careful about your speech, you know, be nice, don't gossip, you know, you can say, like, don't be mean to your friends, you know, be sure to, you know, give money to the poor. They can tell, they, they get the concept, right? But it's only as an adult that when you actually study all the laws around how you use your speech, there's a lot of very subtle stuff, right? Okay, don't gossip. Well, what does that mean? Right? Like, if I ask you for a job recommendation for someone and they were terrible, can you tell me or is that gossip? You're sort of passing on negative information. I, I don't know. Is that okay? Like, what, what are the exceptions, right? There's a lot of complexity here, and I just think as an eight-year-old, right, like you're not necessarily going to understand that. So I just, I think, and also, you know, spirituality, right? Like, kids are concrete. A man in the sky who loves you, that's a great image for a kid, right? You're not going to tell a five-year-old, God is everything, and you know, the divine, but it's just like, it's, they don't think abstractly, but as an adult, once you actually kind of grow up, you can actually be open to mystical conceptions of God. You can study Buber, you can study Heschel, you can study all of these great theologians who have really sophisticated and interesting ideas about God that you can't when you're seven. Um, so in the book, you cover a really broad range of material, really kind of suit nuts kind of Judaism for the uninitiated. Which chapter was the hardest to write? Oh, you'll remember this. Laura and I have been friends for many years. I really struggled with the chapter on prayer. Um, I read this 10 volume series about prayer that basically looks quite extraordinary. They go through an Orthodox prayer book, line by line, and they have a bunch of very academic people commenting on it, and the halakha, this prayer is this, and the really quite rigorous, and very serious, and I just, just got to the point where I just felt like, this is very hard to sell. 
right? Like this is this is um, some tough stuff here. And I'm I'm personally not much of a synagogue Jew. It's not really where I find my deepest spiritual connection. I'm more of a study Jew. Um, and so I, I actually and there came a point when I was writing my prayer chapter where in one day I called my agent and I asked him if I could have nine more months to write the book, and he said no. And that, that was it. Then I called my dad and I said, like, okay, if I can't write this book and I have to give back the advance, can I live with you guys again? Like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my mortgage. We sort of talked that through, and then I called the rabbi, who was a good mentor of mine named Jordan ben Pell. And I just said, I can't, the theology in this prayer book is it's crazy. And he said to me, you know, Sarah, I gotta tell you, there's a difference between reading prayer prescriptively and descriptively. If you're going to read this prescriptively as prescribing a theology that you must accept or reject, it's not going to go well for you, right? But if you can read these prayers descriptively as a description of your ancestors' hopes and fears and longings and joys, right? If you can, can you empathize with that? You know, I might write be a prayer about how, okay, if we're really good, you know, if we're really obedient to God, He will allow the rain to come through our fields, our cattle will flourish. But if we're naughty, no rain for us, like. I don't believe that, right? But can I identify with just like the yearning and the fear that these ancient people felt being so at the mercy of the elements? Right? That's a very moving human emotion. Second of all, our prayers are incredibly sophisticated once you actually know something about them. So I think studying prayer with Rabbi Eli Kumper, who's at the Dar, Yeshiva in New York, he's a brilliant scholar of prayer. And you know, you study a prayer like Unatan Tokev, which some of us just said at the High Holy Days, right? Who will live? God decides who will live and who will die and who by fire and who by water. Like, I'm not, I'm not buying that. But what's really interesting is that the, the book of the Bible that that prayer most frequently quotes from is the book of Job, which, just to review, this is a book about how God punishes a totally righteous man named Job. Job confronts God and says, I've been totally righteous. Why are you ruining my life? And God essentially answers, you don't know what it's like to be me, so back off. And this is not really a book that substantiates a clear cut, like God is just, reward and punishment theology. It's actually a book that entirely questions it, which again is what I so appreciate about Judaism and sophistication, right? The doubting, the questioning. And to understand that Unatan Tokov is quoting from Job, right? There's like a theological subtweet there, right? That there is something very edgy about that. Something that's like, huh. Or the first blessing of the Amidah, which is a prayer we say, you know, some Jews say daily, Shabbat, whatever your practice is, very common core, no, the prayer known as the prayer. If you look at the first blessing, it ends by meant by calling God shield of Abraham. Like, oh, what a weird phrase. Where does that come from? Oh, it comes from the Torah. And it actually comes, it's a phrase from a part of the Torah where God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to give you the promised land. And Abraham does not respond like, yeah, God, you're awesome. Or, wow, God, I so believe everything you say. I believe you. Abraham responds by saying, how am I to know I'm going to possess it? Right? Like, this is God coming to him. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know who you are, God, but how, how do I know? Right? It's a moment of doubt. It's like a moment of, sort of challenge and confrontation. And that's what this prayer is beginning with. So I just think both the prescriptive, descriptive reading and the kind of understanding of the complexity was very helpful to me. Um, but you know, that's not obvious when you're sitting in a synagogue, just muttering away for hours on end, responsive reading. It's very, you know, we don't we don't talk about this. I, I actually am increasingly less and less of a fan of the kind of let's sit for four hours and recite these words that we don't know. I wish we would take two of those four hours and actually say what they mean, and then maybe we could say them. Just an idea. I do remember when you were writing that um, prayer chapter um, announcing that you were giving up on Judaism and becoming a Buddhist mm -hmm. on more than one occasion. Yeah, I was like, okay, this is guys, new title, How I Became a Buddhist. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's interesting to me that you don't, you didn't answer the, the, the God chapter, you have a God chapter in this book, right? And I think for, for many um, religiously identified folks, for many Jews of you know, religious belief and none, God is the hardest question to answer when it comes to comes to religion. It's such a loaded term, it's such a loaded concept. Um, in the book, you say that you had a God-shaped hole in your life. Wow. Wall. Wow. <laughs> um, what did that mean? <laughs> so you know, you hear Christians often talk about like a God-shaped hole. I felt like I had a God-shaped wall, which is like in the shape of an old man with a beard, and I just could not get beyond that wall. It's like I don't believe there is a big man controlling things. Like I don't, I don't buy it. I find it very frustrating when people do try to do the mental gymnastics for me. It's like, you know, you go down this the same kind of like neural grooves, like 
God is all all powerful, all good, and all knowing, and God controls everything. It's like, okay, well, if God's all good, then like, what about the Holocaust? You're like, oh no, people did the Holocaust, not God. It's like, okay, so what's God doing all day? It's sort of complicated. It's, it's a mystery. We can't know. It's like, I'm not interested. I'm just, I'm just not interested. And I, I just, you know, I, and I think actually a lot of Jews post Holocaust are also really not interested in that kind of theology because I think it's just, um, it's really a difficult one. And so I think. Fortunately, you know, you look at Jewish thinkers from throughout the ages and modern thinkers who have proposed a wide range of conceptions about God, right? I mean, I actually love Harold Kushner, who wrote when why do like uh, when bad things happen to good people. He said, you know what? No, God's not all powerful. I'm not buying it. So you know, I think God is all good and all knowing, and I don't think God can really do very much to help us, but can just know about our suffering, kind of be there, keeping us in mind. Just like okay, that at least is like. You know, I don't know if I buy that, but that at least is a conception that doesn't seem kind of obscene to me. Um, there are the mystics who say that God is everything, right? You're God, I'm God, me punching you makes no sense because you're literally, you're the divine. Which like, I don't know, if every, if every homeless person you walk out by on the street were the divine, right? If you really thought this person is God, you're not gonna walk by them. Right? That's a, it's actually quite a moving idea. You, you have Buber who says that God is what arises between two people who are in deep, human relation with each other, like fully seeing, respecting, appreciating the other person, what arises between them is God. You have Mordecai Kaplan who says that God is the process by which we become our highest, truest selves. Right? Like, and I, I, you should, no one should take any of these concepts too literally or hold them too heavily. I think you know there are dozens and dozens of these, and I think each of them just illuminates to me some aspect of the divine. Um, I also think like experience is important. Right? Rabbi Art Green has a beautiful passage, which I quote, where he says, you know, think about the moment your child was born, or the moment you were holding the hand of your parent as they took their last breath, or a moment when you were out in nature at night, looking up at the sky and just feeling so tiny in this infinite universe, or a moment where you were listening to a piece of music and you were just overwhelmed by the beauty of it, right? Like, he was sort of speaking to these moments that feel transcendent. Well, whatever, I don't, can you explain it? I don't know, is it like defending the court of law? No, but there's something there, right? And I think that combination of kind of experience with some of the theology, you know, theological study, I think it was gotten me to the point where people say like, well, do you believe in God, right? Yeah, very deeply, right? I have a very profound sort of felt sense of the divine, which by the way, I relate to as a you, even though I don't think the divine is being. Makes no sense, right? Like, I, I can't relate to the everything. I can't believe, relate to a force. My small human brain is only capable of relating in the language of human relationship, which involves calling someone a you. It involves feeling love, but I don't think I'm talking to a being, but I, I feel it as being. If you ask a tree, you would probably have a different word than love. I don't know, this is just, you know, you can say this is all irrational, it's just neurons in your brain. Yeah, I agree, totally. Plenty of non-spiritual explanations of it, but like, why do you love your spouse? I guarantee you, I can find someone with every characteristic your spouse has, but you don't love them. Why, why, I don't know, what, why, is, why do you love them? Neurons in your brain, sure. Or maybe there's something there that's special. It's, you know, you can put all this in secular language. I just choose to <clears throat> put it in spiritual language because it's more meaningful to me. What was your process for writing this book? One of the things that um, I noticed and, I, and others have noticed too is just is how extensive the list of sources um, is at the back of the book. I think it takes up a solid like, quarter <laughs> of the book. Um, did you read all of these? Did you talk to people? Um, did you make a conscious effort to talk to different Jews, rabbis, and scholars from across the denominational spectrum? Um, because my sense is with this book that you you you're not espousing a particularly sort of denominational lens, right? You use a lot of I voice. You talk about your own experiences, but you attempt to capture sort of a range of perspectives on some of the issues that you talk about that might be held um, by Jews from different kind of walks of life. How did you? research that? What did your process look like? Yeah, I mean, people have remarked to me that, like, never has this collection of rabbis appeared together in the, the same book, right? It is a very, you know, I, I quote ultra-Orthodox rabbis. I've studied with, I quote, super funky hippie renewal rabbis, right? I, I quote just a wide range because I think a lot of people have different things to offer that moved me, that challenged me, that inspired me. And so I actually didn't do interviews for this book. You know, people I'm quoting, I've read their books for most, most, you know, some of them are friends or people I've studied with, but I mainly just read hundreds of books. 
that was my main process, and I did it chapter by chapter, and it was, I did this way too quickly. You know, it, it, I did, I wrote the manuscript in 17 months, which involved like 70 hour weeks, no breaks, not ideal. Um, but yeah, it was a tremendous amount of reading. And this is, you know, the reality about Judaism is I think we keep trying to kind of make it easy, right? It's like, it's Rosh Hashanah, let's drink apple and honey tea It's like, has fun, that's great, but like, well, what is the spiritual meaning of Rosh Hashanah, right? And I actually think like you have to read some books, you just or attend some classes. You actually have to do some work, and it's funny. We're so happy to do that in other parts of our lives, right? We'll go to an exercise class, but we don't go there just to hang out with our friends. We, we actually do some work because we know that makes us healthier, right? Like we are happy to take a you know in college and graduate school, like we did some work because we knew we would actually learn more. And I, I think Judaism is actually the same, right? But we somehow decided that that's not the case, and I you know. You don't just sit down and kind of read Shakespeare and immediately understand it. You actually need someone, you need to learn it. You need to kind of study it. And I think that's the case with Judaism as well. Um, so what do you hope that readers will take away from your from your book? And I'm thinking not only about Jewish readers, but non-Jewish readers who might pick up your book too. So for non-Jewish readers, I really, I just, I hope lots of seekers read this book. You know, I hope people who are just curious about Judaism, and I hope they walk away thinking like, this is an extraordinary tradition. I hope that the non-Jewish partners of Jewish spouses think like, hey, this is something I want to be part of our family, right? This is something I'm really excited to be part of. Whether or not they convert, I don't, not my business, I don't care, but you know, if like you were married into a Jewish family, like if you, you sort of understand it, you have a kind of connection to it. And for Jews, I really, my, my main thing is I want them to see that there is something many things in Judaism that are extraordinary, that are moving, that are meaningful, that are wise, and I want to inspire them to learn further. However they do it, whatever they want to learn, there's an appendix of resources in the back of my book, which just includes tons of resources, first introductory ones, and then resources on specific topics. So I say read a few intro books, and then pursue what you want. If you like, if you're passionate about spirituality, here are a bunch of books on God. If you want to learn about the holidays, here are holidays books. So I, I hope people will be inspired to learn. Um, so from uh, when you began this book, you were an, an expert on political speech writing. Um, and by the end of the book, you have developed your own sense of expertise in the study of, of Judaism. I'm curious what you, what, you, what do you now know about Judaism in America um, based on the research that you've done for this book, the, the journey of writing this book, and the, sort of the personal exploration? that you've done as well? So I think, the, I mean, that could be a whole, you know, but I, I think the main thing that really strikes me is that I think we kind of made a bet in America on Judaism as kind of an ethnicity, which again, makes no sense because Jews are of every race and ethnicity, but we sort of really doubled down on like peoplehood, identity, feeling like you're, you feel Jewish, you kind of feel like you're a part of the family, which is lovely and very important, right? Judaism is not just a religion, it is a peoplehood. However, that's like a three to four generation bet in America, right? Think about how many people go around being really proud to be German in America. And when their family came here in 1880, they're like, I am a proud, it's just how many people deeply identify as being Italian or Irish anymore? In some ethnic communities they do, but that's just not, right? White ethnicity is kind of fade over time. And I, I worry a little bit that we've kind of gone down the path of thinking of ourselves as a white ethnicity. And I, I don't think that's sustainable, right? That that's, we do need to feel like part of people, because we are one. But in America, that's necessary, but not sufficient. I think we actually need to know something, not to be a broken record, but, and not just about Jewish religion, but about history, culture, traditions, law. Like we actually need to know something, because if we're just kind of feeling Jewish, like I don't, I don't know what we're passing on, right? It's like, oh, we, Rosh Hashanah, New Year, thing we do, it's like, I don't know how long that can last, and so I think, I've been thinking a lot about that, how, how desperately, you know, it's great, it's amazing that we send, you know, 700,000 kids to Israel every year to make them feel connected to Israel and get an identity, I think that's great, but like, have we sent 700,000 kids to learn something about Judaism, right? That's sort of my question. Have we sent any kids? You know, this is sort of, I think this is something that we need to turn to now, um, because I, I actually want us to be passing down something of substance to our kids. Uh, what reactions have you had from this book? And have you been surprised by the reactions that you've got? I've been very surprised because I really thought, I, I kind of, I've been surprised 
by just how little pushback I've gotten. Like, I actually thought a lot of people would be offended or would say that I was wrong, or I, I was sort of prepared for that, because like, the audience is Jews, come on, that's how we are. But I've been surprised at how very observant people have told me that the book touched them. I've had a lot of very observant people say, like, you're such a kindred spirit, which is funny because in my practice, I'm really not. But I think what they see in my book is my deep love for Judaism. I think they see my commitment to studying. I think they see the 550 endnotes, and they say, like, I don't agree with this woman. I don't like how she practices, but boy, she actually took the time to care and to do her homework. And so I think people respect that, even if they disagree with me. And a lot of folks who are not observant, who are very disengaged, have said, like, I had no idea. Right? I had no idea this was here. I now, I moved, right? Like, this is great. And I've had people who are, like, Christians, or just people of no faith who said, oh, I love the morning rituals. Like, we don't have anything like that around death in my background. Like, I want to do this. I wish I, I wish I could have sat shiva when my dad died, right? Which is it's very moving to me. Or, wow, like what you wrote about gossip. I just did a podcast interview with a guy, no religious tradition, and he said, you know, your section on gossip really made me think, really made me realize how much damage I was doing with my speech. You don't have to be Jewish to appreciate this, right? People of any background can appreciate the wisdom Judaism offers, and I very much appreciate the wisdom of other religious traditions. You know, we don't proselytize, thank God, but don't proselytize doesn't mean don't share. And I, I appreciate what people of other faiths have shared with me, and I, I'm excited to share Judaism with people of all backgrounds, and all faith backgrounds and none. Um, what was the process of writing, um, how was the process of writing a book? How did that compare to the process of your writing as a, as a speech writer? Because in, in some ways, although this is a very different departure from your sort of typical post-White House career, you're a writer and you've remained a writer. Um, is there continuity there or is this a very different kind of process? I mean, it's just like a, you know, a 93,000 word book is very much more difficult to structure and manage than a 1,500 word speech. I also think there's just a huge difference between writing to be heard, which you do for speeches, and writing to be read, which you do for big books. Different art. I'm just gonna stop now. I said different art, period. Right, that that's you can't write that. That's not that's not a sentence. But no one here was thinking, well, that was ungrammatical. Like that was a sentence fragment, right? We are you know, written language is very much contained by the rules of grammar and by the by punctuation. Spoken language is not. So as a speechwriter, my speeches are filled with sentence fragments. The most common punctuation I use is an ellipsis. So I want to show what a pause looks like. You can't do that in written language, and I think it was really challenging for me to realize, like, wow, I can't start every sentence with and. <laughs> That's not what I would, you know, I can't, I can't have sentence fragments. I know, I can't, I don't know how to use commas, which was like a big, you know, the copy editing was interesting. It was like, really? That's where the comma goes? Like, I, it doesn't sound right to me, right? It doesn't sound, like, it didn't sound right to me, but, you know, this isn't meant to be heard. So I think that transition was actually quite hard. Um, I'm curious what your White House colleagues have, have made of your decision to write a book about Judaism, one of the... The anecdotes that I really enjoyed reading in the book was the, the one about uh, being at a happy yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, right. for those who haven't read the, read the book yet. Um, would you want to share the story? Yeah, well, it was the final year of the White House, and you know I was thinking about writing this book and doing all the studying. And I was at a happy hour with some of my colleagues like, a few months before the administration would end. And I just walked up to two of them who were deep in conversation, and I said, like, oh, what are you guys talking about? And one of them said, well, actually, we're talking about the afterlife. Hell, oh, are you kidding? No way. So I said, like, that's amazing. Can I join you? you know, can we talk about God, too? And the other one looks at me and is like, what? what? And she goes, oh, no, Sarah, the afterlife. Like, what we're going to do after we leave the White House. <laughs> like, I was like, right, you guys thinking, like, corporate work or you going to stay in politics? It was very, very awkward. But yeah. I, you know, I think they were kind of surprised. Not not like people were shocked, right? But I, I, I think they're actually, they're really excited. And I think very proud. You know, the Obama White House, like, we were like family to each other. You know, so I think that they see me pursuing this passion of mine and just the outpouring of support, of generosity, of love for my colleagues has just been amazing. They are always tweeting about my book. They are always posting on Facebook. They are always, they put me on their podcast. I mean, they are just... You know, they really are my brothers and sisters, and I, um, yeah, I, they're, we were very supportive of each other, right? There, there just is this kind of love in that White House. We all feel like we were part of something really special, and I think there's a lot of pride in me doing something I'm passionate about, and me exploring my heritage and my tradition. Like, 
And the white Obama White House people were proud of their cultures, their faiths, their religion. That was something that diversity was embraced and really celebrated. I mean, every year, Barack Obama insisted on having a Seder, right? Like, you could have done it the first year, gotten the credit, and moved on, right? You don't have to do that every year for people to say, the first White House Seder. He did it every year because it wasn't a publicity stunt. He loved the Seder. And so Obama loved the Seder, right? That was something really special to them. So it says a lot about them and that White House. So it, it was just like the West Wing. Just like the West Wing. <laughs> um, was, it, was it difficult to be exploring Judaism, exploring Jewish learning, sort of going on the, the personal journey that you recount in the book whilst also working at the White House, which is such a, such a demanding place to, to be? Yeah, I mean, at times, right, it was sort of balancing, like, going to classes with, you know, working and things like that. But, you know, I had a period of some months where I experimented with doing a rigorous Shabbat, right? And I told my colleagues, like, I'll be offline for 25 hours. And they said, of course. Right? Like, what, you know, and I said, my phone will be on. If there's an emergency, you can call me, but I'm not going to check my email. They said, of course. Right? Like, that was fine, you know? Jack Lou, who was the White House Chief of Staff, and then the Treasury Secretary, is an Orthodox Jew who rigorously observes Jewish law. Jack Lou was doing Shabbat, right? The White House Chief of Staff is the most important job in the White House other than the President. So again, I should tell you about the Obama White House. Um, but yeah, you, you always say it's always a trade-off, right? I, one year, Yom Kippur was the day before Mrs. Obama's speech about the Access Hollywood tape and Trump's celebration of sexual assault. And you know, I began to realize like I can't be offline that whole day. So I went to services, I fasted, but I didn't work on the speech. And I thought a lot about it. And I did not tell Mrs. Obama because she would have been heartbroken if she thought that I was in any way, you know, making any kind of sacrifice like that for her. But it didn't in the end feel like a sacrifice because I I thought deeply about it and I thought like, yep, by working today, I am definitely violating the Jewish laws around Yom Kippur, which stipulate that it is like the Shabbat of Shabbat. You do observe the rules of Shabbat, but I'm also following a lot of Jewish laws about how we treat the vulnerable, about pursuing justice. And I decided those laws were more important to me than the ritual laws, and I made a considered decision, but it's always a balancing act. What was the most Jewish speech you've ever written? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Hmm. So the final commencement address that Mrs. Obama gave in the White House was at the City College of New York. And I found out about this, I was very excited because when my great-grandmother first came to America, she and her husband moved to New York and she was so excited because they had four daughters and there was the city college system and which accepted women, they accepted Jews, and it accepted people who were poor, which was her family. And so she thought, like, my girls can go to college, like, what a great country. But then the family moved out of state. And so my grandmother, one of those daughters, she always wanted to go to law school and go into politics. Like, that was her dream growing up, but she didn't get the chance because they had left New York. And so, you know, to roll up there two generations later with the First Lady of the United States and to be before this class of graduates who come from 150 nationalities, who speak 100 languages, these kids, some of them commute an hour or two hours a day around, you know, to and from school, to computer school. <clears throat> they work two and three jobs. They are almost all immigrants or their parents are immigrants. I just thought, like, this is today's striving, dreaming immigrants. This is where my grandmother desperately wanted to sit two generations ago, and here I am, I am a lawyer, I am working in politics, I am living the dream that she never had the chance to live. And it was a very moving moment to see Mrs. Obama stand up there and say, you know, immigrants are what make this country great. Our diversity is our greatest strength. That has been true for generations. And, you know, I think that's very much true of the Jews, our family. I think it's very much true of this, these students who are just so extraordinary and talented, so striving and ambitious and God, these kids work so hard. So it was just really quite a joy to have that, what felt like a very Jewish moment, a very Jewish speech. So politics has obviously changed a lot in the time since you left. The White House, Washington has changed a lot. The White House has changed a lot. Um, what advice would you give to, to students who are looking to go into politics, who are looking to, um, to, to become a political speech writer? Um, what would you tell our students in the audience today? So I think what's really important, and this is advice I give very carefully because it's advice that a lot of people can't take, but I will tell you that like doing internships is really important, and they're often unpaid, so I hate giving that advice because it is so unfair and people can't afford it. 
But you don't necessarily, you don't have to move to Washington and pay for an apartment, all of that. That's unaffordable for most people. But can you live with your family in your hometown and work for a local elected official? Right? Can you, here at Michigan State, can you write for the president? Can you go to the president and just say, I know you give a lot of speeches, can I help you with that? Are there deans you can write for? Are there local politicians around here that you can volunteer for, even if it's just like a couple hours a week? You know, that is a way to get some experience and then someone says, oh, she's actually, she's worked before, she has some experience, okay. So I think that that's really important. I also just think it's important to start to really think about like, what do you believe? You know, what are your values? What do you want to fight for? Because people often ask me, like, oh, would you work for a Republican? And the answer is no. Right? I don't write just to write. I write because I have certain values. And I think it's very important to be very clear about what you're fighting for. Um, I had a number of students. I was a fellow at Harvard for a semester right after the White House. And I had a number of students who were Republicans who came to me and said, like, I, I want to serve my country. You know, I want to work in the White House. What should I do? And I had to tell them, like, does this, I had to ask them, does this represent your Republican beliefs? And you know, if it doesn't, I wouldn't do it. Right? Like you're, you're actually working for a certain cause. If this is not representing the beliefs you've just told me about, which is like small government, fiscal conservative, you know, everything, like if that's not what it is, I wouldn't do it. You know, you're doing this for a purpose, and the work you do in politics has a real world impact. So you just have to be very thoughtful about what you actually want to achieve in the world. So what's next? <laughs> Great question. I would, uh, I'd really like to write another book. Um, but I'm very focused right now on promoting and selling my first one. It turns out it's actually pretty hard to sell a Jewish book that's not about anti-Semitism or Israel, which is deeply depressing because I think the equation of anti-Semitism plus Israel equals Judaism is a, it's like the music, it's like the music at Judaism's funeral, right? But that is, I don't really know what to do with that. So I, yeah, I feel like I'm fighting a little bit of that tide, right? I'm trying to break through and say, actually, how about like, Wisdom that will transform your life, plus beautiful rituals and traditions that will lead to an amazing experience with your family, plus powerful ethical wisdom, plus deep spirituality, plus an amazing history, plus beautiful culture equals Judaism. Like, can we, can we have a new equation, right? I don't, I don't mean to dismiss Israel or anti-Semitism. Those things are important, but to reduce a 4,000-year-old tradition to those two parts, I think, is a real tragedy, because we have so much to offer to ourselves, to the world, and I. I I regret that this is what it's come to, so I think just trying to create some room for the rest of Judaism is, is my mission for right now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, at, at this point, I'd like to open it up to any questions that we might have from the audience for Sarah, questions about um, the book, um, about the subjects that we've uh, covered today, other subjects. Um, questions from the audience? So what is the greatest speech in the Jewish literature that you've read? The greatest speech in the Jewish literature? What a great question. Um, wow, I would, I would need to give that some real thought. No one has ever asked me that. It take a year or so. Yeah, I think I would take a year or so. Um, yeah, I'm mean, gonna think, it would, have, it would probably be something in the, it would be probably something in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, I gotta think on that, it's a great, that's a great question. Uh, I think a lot about Moses because I think he's such a fascinating character. Right? This is a guy who wants nothing to do with this. He is like, please leave me alone, God. I don't want to do this. He is such a reluctant leader, and he's just so, just heartbreaking as he's just struggling through this. He's dealing with these horrible Israelites. They are such brats, and they're whiny, and they're difficult. And he's just like this kind of heroic character. So maybe, maybe one of his speeches. I'm gonna need to think on that though. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, question at the back. When you wrote your uh, book, what type of uh, relationship did you have with your editor? Did you have a first draft and then turned it over to the editor and then they revamped it completely or gave you minor suggestions? How did that work? So I think my relationship was a little unusual in that I'm a speechwriter. And when you're a speechwriter, you have no editor. right? You are your own editor. And so you, need to, you begin to rely on your colleagues to kind of give you edits that you need to then use to kind of make your speech better. Even if their edits are terrible, you just somehow, like even terrible edits, in rejecting them, I would often see, they're wrong, but I, they have kind of, this paragraph actually could be better. You know, so I, I, so I basically showed my book to, you know, 60 rabbis, right? I mean, like so many, I had dozens of rabbis, scholars, friends, Professor Yari is one of the people who read some of my chapters. 
Um, and I got edits from them. And so I kind of did my speechwriter thing of being my own editor. So that by the time my first editor was fired, which is absolutely part standard in the publishing industry today, um, but she did have time to read my book, and then my second editor also read it, and their edits were very minor, right? It was like commas, definitely an issue for me, a few suggestions about how, like, headlines and some of the chapters to make it easier, but they mainly said like, this is pretty clean, right? I think they were expecting it to come a little rougher, but I just don't, that's not an option as a speechwriter, so I think maybe next time I won't edit so much, maybe they can do more work, but I think this time around it just wasn't much. But I will say other people who don't have as much of a writing background, they get extensive edits from an editor, right? An editor will demand that they rewrite the whole thing, will heavily line edit. It. it really just depends on the, the person writing, the editor, it's, it's very individual. But you, you did get some um, confusing edits from some of the rabbis that oh, yeah. I mean, you showed it to me. Right? You know, I was determined to show this to people, rabbis of every background, and it would be like amazing how you know, Rabbi A would look at a line and just say, this is this is the heart of Judaism. This is exquisite, you've gotten it, you've nailed it, this line is so beautiful. And Rabbi B would look at a line and say, this is nonsense. Like, you, are, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is utterly wrong and just totally contradiction to Jewish tradition. And they would be talking about the same line, which is, you know, what I love about Judaism and very typical of White House speech writing, right? You get contradictory edits all the time. And, as a speechwriter, you are empowered to represent your principal, the president or the first lady, and say, you know what, she would like this better, no. And so I was like, well, I don't, I don't like Rabbi B, and I like what Rabbi A is saying, okay. But I always wanted to know Rabbi B. But I always wanted to know, like, what is the counter argument? What am I missing? Because I want to make sure that when I, you know, I never want there to be some counter argument or some contradictory piece of information that I didn't know about. I wanted to know about that information and know that I was deliberately rejecting it. I did not want any surprises of someone who reads my book and says, you missed this whole body of Jewish law, right? That's very important to me. And you know, I, I think I think that excessive amount of vetting that I did, it, it did help. Um, did you write did you ever write the speeches in the in the White House that got um, rejected in the same way that that rabbi told you that you had uh, got Jews totally wrong and sampled the library speech? I mean you had lawyers reading these speeches and would be like, you can't say that, that's violating this act, I mean, you have, you know, our fact checkers, I mean, literally, I might have a line at the beginning of a speech that would say, it's so great to be here with my friend, Mayor so-and-so, she's doing a great job in the city, and the fact checkers would send me an email that would be like, flag, Mrs. Obama referred to the mayor as a friend, what is the true nature of their relationship, how often do they see each other, are they truly friends, perhaps, like, acquaintance would be better, or, and then they'd be like, flag, Mrs. Obama said the mayor is doing, quote, a great job. However, we've attached three articles in the local newspaper complaining about the mayor's policy on S. Please consider changing to good. It's like, yes. So, you know, I'm used to that. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Um, at, the, at the back. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Uh, what do you think Judaism has done most to make us drift away from Judaism. And how would you change the ritual service so that it is more um, embracing of people coming in and, and people enjoy coming to services again? You know, I think we've structured modern Judaism entirely around a couple of services at a synagogue, right? And, and also a Seder, which is nice. That's out of homes, that, that there's something to that. But I think you know, services, you know, synagogue services are not how everyone connects most deeply, right? Some people do, but I think a lot of people like me don't, right? That's not, like, I connect very deeply through study. For me, studying Jewish texts is a deeply spiritual experience, right? I really am moved by the wisdom and the insight. So I think probably the, the hyper-focus on the synagogue <clears throat> probably has driven some people away. I'll also say, you know, and I'm, I'm not saying get rid of the synagogue or start, that's not my perspective at all, but I also think, you know, we structure Jewish education around the bar and bat mitzvah, right? It's all to kind of prepare you to know the Hebrews so you can do your bar and bat mitzvah, but, you know, I, I don't know how many reform, you know, kids in the reform movement are actually going to go grow up and go on to lead services at their synagogue, right? Like, that might make sense for a young Orthodox kid who might actually become, you know, be a prayer leader in his or her minion, but, you know, I just, I wonder, like, is the 60 hours that that kid spent memorizing 
a bunch of verses in Hebrew and reciting them, like would maybe that 60 hours have been better spent learning about Judaism at the age of 13, where he or she is actually probably old enough to really start to kind of engage and grasp. And I'm not saying get rid of bar mitzvah or bar mitzvah. I'm just saying, you know, is this the best use of our time? Right, I think, you know, rabbis spend probably one sixth of their year preparing for high holiday services, right? They're very time consuming, they're very stressful. All the tickets, all of the logistics, all of the sermons, right? And I just, I don't know how many Jews walk away from those experiences on the high holidays thinking, that was it. I was transformed by that. I learned so much, I feel different now, right? So I guess my question is like, are we spending time on the things that are most transformative for Jews? And I don't know, but I think it might be time to start doing some reimagining. I don't think we should get rid of services, right? They, they're an important part of who we are. I don't think we should trash these prayers, right? These have been handed down to us over thousands of years. I'm not, I have no problem, I'm not gonna get rid of them, right? But I do need to interpret them, right? I don't think we should just recite them. I think that we should actually understand what they say and reimagine them, the meaning of it for ourselves. So maybe instead of four hours of services, maybe there could be one or two hours of actual learning, and then one or two hours of praying in a very deep, unknowledgeable, kind of connected way. I don't know, I, I don't have, I'm not the solutions person here, right? I, I, I read about my experiences, my feelings and opinions. I can't speak to what's good for others, but I think maybe some re-examining of what we're currently doing might be helpful. Kirsten. Um, so I think that Totally fine. <laughs> um, but I, so I'm interested is a way you described it so beautifully and like it was a family and connected to values and so meaningful. But I have to say that like I, I'm sure that people will ask you like when people think about politics, they don't always think of it as completely values. And even the people who are really animated by values, there's compromises and there's gossip and there's all kinds of things associated with politics that might be negative. And so I don't really know what my question is other than. Did your turn to Judaism have to do with having been immersed in that kind of situation, maybe? Or did you feel it to be a disjuncture to move from a space where you were, maybe in part, had some of those experiences, and then move to sort of a study of values and of spirituality? It's not really a question, but... Yeah, no, 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 that makes total sense to me. I mean, my experience in politics didn't really drive me to Judaism, right? Like, a random breakup drove me. It was, it was not... I really wish I had a better story, because it's just no one believes it, but that is actually the story. Um, but I think that studying Judaism certainly helped me clarify and better understand what I was doing in politics. Um, I think just like, I, I think the core animating Jewish idea is an idea stated in the Torah, which is that we are all committed, that we are all created in the image of God, right? I, you don't have to believe in any kind of God, right? That you can be an atheist to understand the power of that state, that statement, which you know, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg speaks often about this. He says that, you know, he uses, you know, using ancient Jewish texts, he says basically, <clears throat> What this means is that we are all infinitely worthy, we are all totally equal, and we are all fundamentally unique. He calls those the three inalienable dignities. And you can say like, well obviously, right, we all believe that. No we don't, no we don't. How many of us have walked by a homeless person on the street who's asked us for help and we've said, oh I'm sorry, so not today. If that person were Barack Obama, you would have stopped. If they had been at a laptop on the street, you probably would have stopped and said, whose who's laptop is that? Laptop is very valuable, right? You don't, we don't think that that struggling person and Barack Obama, we don't think they're both infinitely worthy, we don't think they're, diff they're fundamentally unique, we don't think they're equal, we don't think it. It's a really countercultural and radical idea that Judaism has to offer. And I think understanding that as the core animating Jewish idea just kind of made me realize that actually that was the core animating idea of my ideas of, of my work in politics. And you're right, like, politics is nasty, there's compromise, I mean, I don't, you know, I have the very, very little patience for the people in politics who need to go down breathing the fumes of their own purity, right? Like, I, that just doesn't interest me. Like, I, my, my work in politics is to alleviate suffering as best as possible. And I, I think about something like the healthcare debate, where it was like, no, it's single payer or it's nothing. Okay, well, the Affordable Care Act insured 20 million people. If you want to sacrifice 20 million people, that's your business, but I'm sure not going to, right? Like. That's just too much human suffering. So yeah, this this maybe maybe more people could have been insured by single payer. That was never going to happen, right? So it's a compromise. Um, nothing is perfect. But I, Joe Nye, who was used to be the dean of the Kennedy School, he once said that the absolutist may avoid the problem of dirty hands, but often at the cost of having no hands at all. And I'm not particularly interested in having no hands, right? So yeah, there are compromises. I think there are lines you don't cross, obviously. But I think that my 
study of Judaism and ethics and the core animating ideas just gave kind of much more substance and depth to these kind of like vague inklings I had of maybe this is what I think. Reading in Judaism, I thought, oh, okay, wait, this is deeper. This is this is a little bit more sophisticated. Oh, this expands my understanding of what, what I'm doing here. So I think in a way it was a uh, just help guide me in politics. But I don't think I was like running away from politics to it. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I was wondering if you had a chance to feel that there's several principles that you can see in other spiritual spiritual, spiritual uh, uh, traditions or other religions that actually. You can see them not just in Judaism, but in other places. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think there's so many common. I mean, I think when you really zoom out to 30,000 feet, like we're, we're all gesturing at the same things, right? What does it mean to be a good and decent and kind and generous human being? What does it mean to find connection with the divine? But right? I actually think these, you know, you see so many spirit, so many, you know, the idea when people say social justice is my Judaism, it's like, that's also your Islam, to Christianity, to, you know, that's, that's actually every faith. I think what makes, what makes each of these traditions unique <clears throat> is the unique way that they approach these topics, right? So Judaism has a lot of thinking, not just that says give to the poor, but how do you give to the poor, right? How much do you do so in a way that doesn't humiliate them? Do the poor have to give? Yeah, they do. The poor actually need to give to other poor people, right? That, which is, that's interesting, right? I don't know if that's necessarily true in other religions. It might be, right? But I think each of these faiths has a very particular way of approaching these that is important and helpful. And I think that, I, I actually think, one of the biggest weaknesses is my, in my own understanding of Judaism is that I haven't studied other traditions. And I actually think studying other traditions helps you understand your own traditions so much more deeply. So that's something I, I would like to remedy. Like I actually really want to take a class to understand other world religions because I think it's, I think my grasp on Judaism will always be a little bit thinner than it should be without that broader perspective. We do offer the intro to world religions. I would love to take that class. I'm serious. <laughs> um, uh, at the very back. Speaker, any question? Did you used to know, listen to the reviews uh, of your speeches, like on CNN or MSNBC, and did they affect you in any way? Oh, so wait, did I ever listen to the reviews of my speeches on CNN, and did they affect me in any way? I mean, definitely. Yeah. You know, I'm not much of a news junkie, not my, you know, I'm not a huge political junkie, but I definitely, you know, I would listen to them, I would hear them. Um, luckily, they tend, you know, people liked Mrs. Obama. Post. You know, in 2008 in the campaign, we tend to forget, but you know, she was had very negative media, right? It was like, oh, she is an angry black woman, which I think reflects the racism and sexism that swirl around women of color in this society. But once people in 2008 actually saw her on a stage, unfiltered by the media, and just sharing who she was, they felt like, oh, she's lovely. She's very smart and really decent, huh? How did we not know this? Like, well, you know. Anyways, um, so yeah, I did watch them. Did they affect me? I mean, sure, like I liked it when they, you know, when they were good, that made me feel good. But at the end of the day, the question was, did Mrs. Obama feel good? Right, these were her speeches, these were her thoughts and ideas, and if she was happy, I don't, I didn't really care about the reviews, that wasn't so much my job. Have you shared your book with the Obamas, and what is their response? <laughs> So when I, I've seen them you know, occasionally since the White House, and I, with the president, we'd always like joke about like, oh, writing a book, it's so hard, you know, that's short joking. So I, I did, I did give them copies. I don't know if they read them yet. They're very busy. But Mrs. Obama, right when the book came out, she sent, a, she tweeted, uh, just an absolutely beautiful tweet. Like it was, it made me cry. It still makes me cry when I read it. It was so kind and lovely, and just a really kind tweet about me. And I think she just. You know, I think they were really proud, right? I think they were just so proud that I was pursuing what I wanted to do. So I don't, I don't know if they read it yet. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they did, right? Because they, they always keep up on their staffers, but yeah, I haven't talked to them about it. Any other questions from the audience about any of the topics that we've touched on this evening? Are you a member of a synagogue? Hmm. <laughs> My favorite question. No, I am not. Uh, nope. Um, you know, I'm I am 42. I'm not married. I don't have kids. So synagogues in Washington D.C. are a very odd fit for me, right? They synagogue life is often structured around families with kids, 
Uh, a rabbi I know once said, Judaism either thinks that you are a kid or that you have a kid, which is, you know, oversimplification, but I think that's true. Unfortunately, it's actually not true of the modern Jewish population. 50% of Jews of a certain, it's like, I don't know, 24 to 54 are not married, similar, exactly the same as the American population, and only a minority of Jews of those ages have kids at home. So we've actually created a synagogue service that serves, a structure that serves a minority of Jews, which may be part of the thing that we've done to drive Jews away. Um, so yeah, there's just no synagogue in DC that's really a fit for someone like me. You know, if I was 25, yeah, I could be in their young single group, that would be okay, but I just, it doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, I go to services at different synagogues and they're great. We have amazing rabbis in DC, like I'm a very big fan of the DC rabbinate. Um, I think if I lived in New York, there's a few synagogues that would be a better fit, right, that are just more, less traditionally family oriented, um, but I do think this is something that we need to think about. And in Judaism, like there's really no life cycle ritual to celebrate milestones in the life of a single childless person, right? Like Judaism contemplates me as a bat mitzvah, as a wife, as a mother. It does not contemplate me as a single 42 year old, right? That does not, you know, traditionally I, I didn't exist, but I do now. And so I think this is something that we need to really think about uh, in the next, in the coming years. All right, if there are no further questions, I'd like you to um, please join me in thanking Sarah for her visit. I refresh this um, outside the auditorium, as well as copies of uh, Sarah's book, opportunity to sign up for uh, the Jewish Studies uh, mailing list and newsletter. It's great to see you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.